um, hello everybody. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, actually, uh, it's um, it's a remote talk from Egypt. Uh, it's a transatlantic presentation, as you see, and uh, and uh, we we are uh, it's th it's three thirty p.m. now in Egypt, so there's a six time six hour time difference, but we're still uh, sharing the same uh, daylight part of the of uh, the world uh, with Boston. So uh, and interestingly, we also uh, share the same a similar geographic uh, environment. As I know that you're very close to the ocean. We have a sea view, uh, and here also uh, we have here. Uh, oh, the slides are not. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know what's what's going on with the slides. Oh, yeah, here. Okay, so and we also share here in my uh, small city, which is only one hour drive from Cairo, uh, a, a similar uh, view at the sea. Uh, at the Suez Canal here, the Suez Canal ships passing through it, and um, I'm located in this area uh, uh, with uh, those surrounding beautiful lakes. Um, so uh, let me also say, um, before I start, let me also say thank you to Dr. David Usim. He's my mentor and advisor from John Hopkins Neuroradiology uh, for recommending me uh, uh, speaking today uh, about the paper that we, uh, we've uh, published recently. Uh, I have no disclosures. Okay, so syringohydromyelia uh, uh, has uh, the prevalence of syringohydromyelia related to Chiari uh, malformation. One has a wide range in the literature, uh, which can be as low as 20% or as high as 80 or 85% in some series. And that is partly due to inconsistent methodologic criteria for defining what is a Chiari depending on the size of the tonsillar herniation or maybe uh, in some, sometimes invalid clinical uh, supporting findings. Or maybe inconsistent methodologic criteria also for defining uh, what's a true steering or uh, differentiating is a true steering from a pre-steering state or uh, just core edema. And also, there are some discrepancy of measurements in those uh, lit in the literature. So our experience was actually different than those uh, numbers, and we we were uh, we were um, uh, actually uh, we wanted to examine uh, th this range and see w where actually uh, where uh, uh, do we uh, lie in this uh, range in the heterogeneous range of literature. Uh, sometimes selection criteria. There's some. There are some bias in the selecting in selection criteria that we uh, use when we include patients in these studies that may falsify results. So, for example, uh, myelopathic patients or patients who are uh, who are included from the surgical archives also um, may have falsified the results or increased the, the results uh, in terms of prevalence. But let's agree that the early diagnosis of syringohydromyelia related to Chiari malformation one is uh, is crucial in terms of uh, 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 determining the management plan, or maybe uh, in terms of surgical candidacy or uh, eligibility of those patients. So our objectives were to determine the prevalence of syringohydromyelia in uh, symptomatic patients uh, with Chiari malformation one and also to investigate uh, a multitude of factors, including uh, demographic, morphometric, osseous, functional, uh, neuropathologic-related factors, uh, such as the age, gender of the patient, uh, the skull base angle, the odontoid angle, and the presence or absence of osseous, craniocervical junction anomalies, and also uh, whether there is compromise of CSF flow uh, using face contrast studies at the frame and magnum. So our main hypothesis in this paper was uh, that skull base anomalies may be related to the formation of steering in symptomatic patients with Chiari 1. We uh, retrospectively included patients from January 2014 to April 2016 at Johns Hopkins Neuroradiology. Uh, there were uh, 108 MR studies, MR studies of patients uh, with a median age of 15.5 years. Our inclusion criteria in a, were tonsillar herniation, uh, at least 
unilateral tonsillar herniation of um, five or more millimeter below the macrae line, and other supporting clinical findings such as those uh, including headache, uh, what we call Chiari type headache, um, peripheral neuropathy, cranial neuropathies, or uh, weakness, neck pain, uh, sleep apnea, and, and other clinical findings. Exclusion criteria actually where any case with tonsillar herniation due to a space occupying lesion and uh, those patients with previous surgeries along the craniospinal axis, uh, including uh, decompressive KI surgery as well. The MR protocol was a, a very basic protocol, so including uh, T1 SAG axial and T2 axial of the brain, and also T1 SAG, uh, T1 and T2 uh, SAG and axial uh, of the spine. And then we could also include uh, phase contrast studies uh, for dynamics SF flow metry with a velocity encoding of 5 cm per second in only 6, 9 out of uh, 108 patients. So after we excluded 7 cases due to poor quality, um, we, we, the end result was uh, only 69 cases uh, we investigated. Then two blinded, uh, then two blinded uh, subspecialty certified neuroradiologists uh, read the cases, uh, followed by a third reading by an expert uh, neuroradiologist who actually worked as a tiebreaker in those cases with inter-rater um, variability. So uh, our main dependent variable was the presence of CRS, uh, which was defined as more than two millimeters sharply demarcated fluid signal in T1 and T2. Uh, we also identified the location and the size of the fluids. And then we, we try to find any association between searing formation and those independent variables, including demographics, age, gender, the degree of tonsillar herniation in millimeter, um, CSR flow compromise, the presence or absence of hydrocephalus, and more importantly, uh, the presence of craniocervical junction, uh, junction osseous anomalies, including mainly platyvagia, retroverted odontoid process, hypoplastic clivus, and the presence of, and basilar vagination. So he, this is here's our definition of uh, of the craniocervical junction osseous anomalies, uh, platyvasia when there is a skull base angle of more than 143 degrees. Uh, we use two intersecting lines, as you see here. Uh, one comes from the uh, nasion to the pituitary gland, and the other from the pituitary gland to the um, to the uh, interior uh, margin of the foramen. Uh, magnum. Uh, there is another angle actually that uh, the, the center here, actually the center that we used here is the center of the cell, which could be different a little bit from other angles, other similar angles that may have been used in other uh, studies, uh, but uh, let me uh, focus on this. We use the center here, uh, the, the, is the, the, our center here, our intersection here is the center of the pituitary gland. And then basilar invagination, as you see here in this case, um, that was defined as the, the presence of the odontoid tip uh, more than, fill, than five millimeter above the Chamberlain line. The Chamberlain line actually connects the uh, posterior heart palate with the uh, posterior lip of the foramen magnum. And then the retroverted odontoid, there are different ways of actually defining this. The, our working definition was an angle, an inclination angle between the uh, long axis of the odontoid uh, process and the C2 uh, body, uh, actually defined by the transverse line here that passes along the, uh, the lower or the inferior end of the plate of C2. And uh, when the angle is more, it is less than 70, as in 70 degrees, as in this case, uh, we define this as retroverted odontoid. And then hypoplastic clivus that you can see in all these cases, actually, we measure the clivus. Uh, from the uh, sphenoclival synchondrosis to the um, to the basium, uh, and when it is uh, the clival length is less than 1.5 centimeter, we define this as a hypoplastic or uh, for clivus. So those were the the most uh, commonly found four uh, osseous anomalies at the skull base that we actually studied in this uh, paper. Okay, so these are our main results. First of all, uh, the prevalence of syringe hydromyelia in our series was 36.1%, uh, was which lies in the lower range, as you see, uh, compared to the literature. Uh, then uh, we found hydrocephalus only in seven cases, and interestingly, three uh, of them actually had no syringe. 
when you look at the location of these hearings, most of our cases, uh, most of the hearings cases were found in the cervical thoracic uh, region. Uh, let me give a highlight on the uh, on the no association result. So the, we could not find any association or statistically significant association between the following: patient's age or sex in CRN formation, uh, the degree of tonsillar herniation in CRN formation, or the presence of CSF compromise at the foramen magnum and CRN formation. And this could be actually explained uh, by uh, by some of the technical limitations that we have. So uh, that will come next in the talk. And also, uh, we, we could not find any statistically significant association between the size of the searings and any of the other tested variants. Uh, we have sizable syringes actually in our study. Um, almost like 25 cases were more than 6 millimeters in, uh, in the widest transverse diameter or axial diameter. Uh, but unfortunately, there was no association between the size of searings and, those, and the other variants. So let me focus now on the on the craniocervical junction osseous anomalies, which was actually our main hypothesis here. So we found that 30 out of uh, 108 patients had at least one bony anomaly identified at the craniocervical uh, junction. And those anomalies, the four ones that I just described, uh, were as follows. The most common one was the retroverted odontoid in 23 cases, followed by platyvisia in 15 cases, hypoplastic clivus in seven cases, and only six patients had basal invagination. There was a strong association between the presence of craniocervical junction osseous anomalies and the presence of, um, and the development of syringohydromelia in our series, uh, and uh, according to the rock curve analysis, and we can't, and also the odds ratio was 4.3 uh, for the, the presence or for the formation of series formation. Uh, as we described before, as we found before, that no uh, association between age and the development of serings in general, but when we look at the 39 serings cases, uh, the presence of craniocervical osseous anomalies were more likely in those patients younger than 18 years of age. Uh, so this is another <coughs> finding. And, and when you look here, this is a plot of the uh, age of the uh, of our of all our patients, and of course the, for the gender here, male and female. You can find that the, the patient and the female group are nicely distributed in different age groups. However, most of our patients in the male group were younger than uh, than 18, and you can see here, actually at 18 again, I see uh, I say that at 18 years of age, uh, there was a, a, a good this. Uh, separation between uh, patients uh, who, um, in, in the group of serine hydromelia, between patients who have associated craniocervical junction anomalies and who are not. Uh, when you when we look at the skull base angle, the nasium cella Bayesian angle, uh, we found that there could be um, a nice cutoff point at 135 degrees. You know that we define platybasia more than 143 degrees, but actually, uh, according to our analysis, uh, at this uh, threshold, the 135 degrees, uh, there was an, a good performance, a fair performance actually of the rock curve here, here with an area under the curve of almost 0.64. Uh, that is actually a classifier uh, in patients with Chiari with or without syringohydromelia. So patients with an angle more than 135 are more likely to, to develop uh, syringohydromelia, and we have the odds ratio here of 4.8. And uh, although actually the sensitivity was was not that good, was only at 50%, but we had a good, pretty good, pretty high specificity specificity at 82.6. So, so even if we don't take this as a threshold or at a, as a cutoff point. At least that implies the importance of measuring the skull base angle. And also it, uh, it gives insight um, uh, of the pathophysiology that actually, uh, that actually uh, can be due to mechanical obstruction at the foramen uh, magnum due to flattening of the skull base. So in conclusion, uh, our prevalence of syringohydromyelia associated with Chiari malformation that was 36.1% lies in the low range compared with existing values uh, in the literature. And we believe that this number uh, may be towards the accurate uh, zone compared to other to some other uh, numbers in the literature. 
And uh, then in view of the statistically significant association uh, between serines <laughs> formation and the craniocervical junction osseous anomalies, and this association actually was more evident in younger patients, less than 18 years, our findings support uh, the role of development of foramen magnum compromise in a, um, in a pathophysiology uh, related to the condition. And before I finish the presentation, uh, I'd like to, uh, to shed the light on uh, some of our study limitations that we believe uh, this might be, this might represent some technical challenges to the results. So we had some sort of uh, inhomogeneity of the data, such as the fewer CSR flow studies. We hope that we get more CSR flow studies to be able to uh, establish um, uh, the relationship uh, between, uh, you know, CSF comp flow compromise and the presence of serums. Uh, also, the cross-sectional design of the study, you know, serious formation, we believe that serious formation in Chiari is a dynamic process that requires uh, some sort of uh, time. And uh, so we need other studies to look at the longitudinal follow-up of these patients and to see what's going on um, over, uh, over a time period. And um, finally, the, we think that quantitative, a quantitative assessment of CSR flow will also represent a valid parameter uh, rather than the qualitative uh, method that we used uh, in our study. Uh, so um, this is my email address, and I'll be so happy to receive any uh, comments or questions after the end of this talk. And uh, thank you.